How will we address the climate crisis? Climate One with Greg Dalton brings together advocates, influencers, and policymakers in empowering conversations that connect all aspects of the climate emergency, the individual and the systemic, the scary and the exciting, to help you understand the most critical issue of our time. Because addressing the climate crisis begins by talking about it. Corporate pledges of reaching net zero carbon emissions have quickly become commonplace. Critics argue that such pledges are mere greenwashing. They say that even if pledges are fulfilled, the balance sheets usually depend on carbon offsets, which can be of questionable quality and accountability. Proponents of corporate net zero pledges say we'll never reach our climate goals without corporate action, and pledges represent legitimate ramping up of corporate ambition and commitment. How can consumers, investors, and policy leaders distinguish between stalling and increased ambition? Corporate Net Zero, today on Climate One. Thanks for joining us for this live stream conversation on corporate net zero pledges, ambitious or empty promises. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area and would like to acknowledge the Ohlone and Miwok people who inhabited these unceded lands for 10,000 years. It's my pleasure to welcome our first string lineup. Simon Fishweiker is head of corporations and supply chains for Carbon Disclosure Project North America. Christina Partsenvelos is a CNBC reporter covering environment, social, and governance and net zero pledges. And Daryl Stickler is global lead for environmental sustainability at Cisco Systems. Thank you all for joining us. It's delighted to have you with us. Um, Christina, let's begin with you. One fifth of the world's 2000 largest publicly traded firms have committed to net zero targets, according to a report you cited recently. Is that legitimately good news? And how important are they for decarbonizing the global economy? No, of course it's good news because finally corporations are making part of their mandates, making a priority. They've created chief sustainability officers. They have people in positions to try to uh, work on reducing emissions, improve their supply chains so they're not as harmful to the environment. Having said that, there's the positive. This, the, I guess the negative is that a lot of it out there, or not a lot of it, some of it out there is a form of greenwashing where corporations are making these goals, but they're not providing us with the steps of us to how they're going to achieve net zero by 2050 or by 2060 or 2040. And so there are still uh, kinks that need to be worked out because this is still somewhat of a, a nascent industry when you're talking about having corporations actually commit to it. And this is the first time we're really seeing that. And so it's great. It could really change the way things are going in the next, you know, 10 to 15 years for future generations. But uh, there still needs to be a lot more details worked out. Sure. And a lot of this is, is voluntary. And we'll drill into those pledges in a moment. Simon, how do you see the symbolism of giant corporations all jumping on the net zero bandwagon? As Christina mentioned, something we haven't seen before. Yeah, I want to acknowledge the importance of the momentum this is creating and the conversation that is move to talking actually about net zero emissions. I think if you think about five years ago, before the Paris Agreement was signed at COP21, I think this was uh, a dream for those of us in the environmental field to have this level of conversation. The challenge, which I, which I think we'll get even more into, is around the standardization of what those net zero pledges are and the, the lack of short to medium term steps, science-based targets that are going to keep us on a trajectory towards cutting emissions, not in 2045, but having them in the next decade. Also sort of the inconsistent boundaries of those net zero pledges. And we can talk about sort of the full value chain versus operational approach. And then how much of those uh, targets are relying on offsets versus direct emissions. So a lot to unpack there, but I'm excited for the conversation. Yeah, early days, the language, the, the terms, the rules are st still not fully baked. Uh, but Simon, before we get into that and bring in Daryl, um, how are these net zero uh, pledges linked to the upcoming UN Climate Summit in Glasgow that we're hearing so much about? Well, I think this is where, you know, as a world, we're converging around net zero by 2050. And so corporations committing to being a part of that world is critical and, and seeing how uh, that one form subnational and national governments uh, driving new policies, making commitments of their own to, to take this forward. I think it's important that businesses sending the signal to those governments that, that, that they're on board. 
Yeah, and I've heard other people say that that corporations uh, doing this creates political space for 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 politicians because the corporations are no longer kind of uh, you know pushing uh, at least uh, against a different goal. Daryl Stickler is a person with climate responsibility at a company with fifty billion dollars in sales. What do you look for when you see a corporation says they're going net zero? They're coming out all the time. You're an insider. What? How do you give them the kick the tires or give them the sniff test? So. I, I do look at the announcements and there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there because some of it gets technical, you know, about the various types of emissions. But the first thing I look for is what's the scope of the the, the commitment. Um, you have to kind of go back to what does net zero actually mean? And the image that I use to describe to people is just imagine our atmosphere is in a room and we all have a door. Every, every person in every company has a door and we release um, emissions through that door into the room. So net zero means if you put emissions into that door, it has to be a revolving door. The same amount has to come out. And that's a little different than in the past where they have these words like offsets and you're not really sure what that means. And the reason for the switch to this official version of net zero is if you look at the greenhouse gas um, concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere, it's just continuing to go up and it's going up faster. So you look at that curve, it's often a little jiggy jaggy line and you look at that and you go, wow, there's been a lot of attention to this over the last 20 years, certainly five years. And yet looking at the curve, it doesn't look like we've made any impact. And so, this concept of net zero has been introduced. And, and so going back to your question, I look to see one is all of a company's activities included in the scope, or are they talking about just the stuff that's at my headquarters site or in this country or only from my operations, but ignoring supply chain. And, and the next is I look for some evidence that they understand what net zero means this concept that I just described. If I see too many use of the word offsets, I scratch my head and then I start to dig a little deeper. What does offset mean? Daryl Stickler, you know, Cisco plans to reach net zero emissions by 2040, a decade ahead of many companies. Um, are you gonna have a third party auditor uh, look at those uh, numbers? And, and why should anyone believe Cisco when there's so much greenwashing going on? And it's not clear that there's a cop on the beat, right? That there's consistently accepted accounting principles as there are for financial statements. I, th I think we're overstating greenwash. Greenwash is an issue for sure, but there's a lot of companies that are putting a lot of money and attention and top talent into this issue of carbon accounting. So to get a little technical, so there's a scope one, two, and three emissions. And let me just start with scope one and two uh, to simplify, not greenwash. Scope one is the fuel that you buy. So if you put fuel in your car, if anybody doesn't have an EV, or if you have natural gas for your house, that's scope one. Scope two is the electricity that you buy. So this is the kind of the foundation of greenhouse gas reporting. It's based on what you buy. So you have invoices and we use a third party. Um, there's a couple. So the large financial um, companies, the accounting firms, they do this auditing as well as specialized environmental consultancies. And they issue formal letters of you know their assurance and the scope and so forth. And we publish ours on our website so people can see you know, this is the scope and this is what they concluded. We've set a number of public goals, environment goals since 2008. And we've always had a policy that if we have a public goal, we're gonna get third party assurance because we recognized early on that us saying something, well, we, we would hope that people would believe us, but the truth is, is they wanna have that third party assurance. And so we've always done that. And in the next six months, uh, corporations will have to start submitting their proposals to an organization. This gets kind of technical, but it's the science-based target initiative. So there's this organization that companies will report to. Is that starting to get in the direction, uh, Daryl? And, you know, what does that mean for companies that might be kind of, you know, inflating their numbers? So SBTI is a, a, 
an organization that gets the goals right. So they've been in existence, I don't know, probably about five years or so. And if you go to their website, you'll see there's hundreds, maybe even thousands of companies whose goals are registered with SBTI. And you get registered there by submitting lots of information. It is very painful. It took us about four months to meet all their information requirements. And they say that, yes, your scope, your wording, your intent meets the requirements. They publish guidelines. And there's a similar thing for net zero. They just came out last month. Uh, don't know the official title, but it's basically net zero guidelines by SBTI. And you can go in there and read. If you wanna say that you have a net zero goal that's SBTI approved, this is what it has to entail. And yes, at the end of the year, or maybe early next year, companies will start submitting their, um, their goal statements to SBTI and they'll do scope assessments. Like the existing goal approval process is um, two thirds, I believe, Simon. It's 67% have to be inside the goal statement and you show them. So that's what SBTI is for, to make sure that these goals are properly framed. So things are, we're kind of in this very early days, starting to get some uh, organizations and some some early standards. Uh, Christina, some companies say they're aiming for carbon neutral rather than net zero. As someone who carefully examines numbers and parses words issued by corporations, how do you see the emerging terminology of this conversation? Well, I think that just like Daryl mentioned, it's going to probably have to come from some platform that everyone is using. And if they come out with a definition, then finally we'll get uh uh, something that's concrete. You have the SEC that's looking into it, but there's no federal mandates. I know the EU has more stringent rules, uh, but unfortunately countries aren't, maybe they are behind the doors. Like I don't, I'm not there, so I don't know exactly, but uh, somebody needs to come out with uh, proper terminology. I don't know when that's going to happen. Even when I'm researching and writing a story or doing this on air, uh, the amount of definitions that I could have used were ridiculous. And instead I just went for a visual of like a circle of how we're going to, how net zero is going to be defined or just how Daryl used the, the, the bed, not the bedroom, but the door analogy. Right. Um, I don't know. I don't know who's going to come up with the definition. Somebody's got to make it official and then we can all start using the same one. But right now, yes, like you mentioned, there's carbon neutral and I'm sure both Simon and Daryl can and speak more to the uh, the details of that or I guess the technical aspect of it. But it's not all the same and companies know this, which is why they're picking in not all. And I'm not greenwashing or saying that it's all greenwashing, <laughs> but uh, the companies are sure to, to pick and choose how they word uh, their marketing uh, statements or their promises to the uh, consumers. So, so, gets, so Greg, go ahead, Daryl. Greg, yeah. Greg um, my, my favorite example is carbon negative and carbon positive oh. mean the same thing. Because those are two other terms that companies use in addition to carbon neutral. Right. Mm -hmm. And some people in regenerative agriculture, other things would say, we're not just going to do less bad. We're going to create positive. We're going to, yeah, go carbon, right. carbon, not neutral, negative. There's a little bit of that, you know, which gets Simon to the question of accountability. A lot of these pledges are made by CEOs who will not be in office when uh, these pledges come due. So how are these companies held accountable and is executive pay tied to these commitments? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I will connect it back to, to Daryl's comment on science based targets, uh, which is an organization CDP actually co founded and co partnered in. And I, just to a plug that net stand uh, net zero standards going to be released this Thursday. So, uh, Christina, uh, for your next story, I think that's a great place to look for some definitions and some specific terms uh, that hopefully will all coalesce behind in the same way. If you look to pre science based targets, people were setting emission reduction targets and we sort of had the same issue. And now there's a place where that can be sort of verified and, and, and checked to say this is a good target to the question of accountability. Um, this is something that's really, you know, an important role for CDP to play where we have this voluntary disclosure where companies are reporting annually, not only making that commitment, getting the flashy lights with the announcement uh, in the news, they have to report on that annually when they commit to setting a science based target or have a net zero target and that mechanism that, that, that most companies use is their CDP disclosure. But if you really dig into it, it's not just 
hey, we have this ambitious target and we're reporting on it annually, but actually looking into governance structures and saying, is there uh, a board level oversight of climate change at this company? Does the CEO have compensation tied to the achievement of this science-based target? And we have seen some companies, I think HP Inc. is one example, uh, a Canadian National Railway, where in their disclosure, they're saying, we have a science-based target and our executive compensation is tied to achieving that science-based target. Um, obviously that still runs into the, the problem that net zero by 2050 is, is, is none of our current CEOs uh, immediate problem. And that's where setting that short to midterm science-based target that reduces emissions in the next five to 10 years in line with that trajectory towards managing a, a 1.5 degree warming or sort of avoiding the most dangerous aspects of climate change today, not just in 2050 is key. Christina, the word net in there implies the possible use of carbon offsets, planting a tree or protecting forests or doing something else, you know, in another part of the world uh, that offsets the reductions that the, co the corporation has. What do you think about carbon offsets and their relationship to these net zero pledges? Well, it's a market that's growing. It's uh, predicted to hit one billion in transactions this year alone. So it's the largest one. Uh, Microsoft, I think they bought 1.3 million carbon offsets themselves. So it's something that's not going away. Again, it goes back to the methodology used and who's going to be verifying how these carbon offsets, um, how the carbon is going to be removed from the air or not just, I know you just mentioned the trees, right? So that's the most commonly like, yeah, it's Forest. an easy one, but there, um, even carbon capture, a lot of other methods are available. Definitely more expensive so um is the like are, are these projects these financing of these projects going forward to help improve uh the environment and remove carbon was that something that wasn't going to happen had they not bought the carbon offsets and so that's something that is still maybe a little bit murky out there yeah um, some some companies and, are getting paid for forests that we're going to not be cut down anyways yeah. yeah yeah exactly like when i first started and i'm still very new to this this world but what stops a lot and there's a lot of scams out there what stops a, a guy that owns a big forest to sell his forest five times to different uh, companies uh, and just say like, oh, I'm going to keep these trees going for you or else they would have been cut down. Um, I don't know. I just there's there's a lot of projects out there and there's a lot of room for growth. It's again, how do we verify it? Simon, similar things. Yeah, there's there's uh, no one standard uh, uh, sort of verifying agency that says, okay, that forest is going to be living for 100 years. It won't burn. A lot of forests are burning down lately, uh, right? Off so the offsets. Your your point there uh, to uh, Christina on, on the the validity of offsets, which are companies relying on smoke and mirrors, literally. Look, I think offsets and building a market around offsets has a really important role. We need to bring all the tools out of the toolbox. But when we talk about net zero, to Daryl's earlier point, if someone's net zero pledge is heavily reliant on offsets to get from today to where their net zero commitment uh, has them in the future, to me, the, without those standards, that's that's very problematic. But also in general, what we're looking for with net zero is for companies to abate their emissions by 90 to 95% of that net zero from their own value chain emissions, whether direct operations or supply chain. And it really should be that last mile, that last five or 10% uh, that's neutralized by offsets. That doesn't mean that during the process of reaching net zero, you can complement the efforts you're making as a company to reduce your value chain emissions and your operational emissions with offsets that help compensate for the emissions that you're, you're already uh, kind of producing. But those shouldn't be considered uh, hand in hand with your trajectory to net zero. And I think that's because of many of the issues that, that Christina is raising. Daryl Stickler, what's to prevent a company, say that the company makes uh, batteries and they say, oh, we've reduced our um, emissions by X amount. And then the, the company that makes the cars or the iPhones that uses those batteries also claims those carbon reductions. What's to prevent double counting in the supply chain? We've seen lots of disruptions in the global supply chain during COVID. What's to prevent double counting? Well, yeah, I think net zero is going to rationalize this because net zero is kind of a good pandemic. We just went through a really damaging, I guess we're still going through it. But when our customers, when Cisco's customers set a net zero goal, I think the first thing they do is pick up the phone and call us because our customers can't be net zero if we're not net zero. 
and then we turn around and we can't be net zero unless our suppliers are net zero because part of our footprint is what it takes to make our products and transport them and get them to the customers. So it becomes more of a partnership and not gamesmanship. But going back to the comments made earlier, you still have to have a really robust reporting scheme and, and assurance. And right now, scope one, two emissions are they're in good shape. I mean, because because it's based on hard data. Everybody has finance systems and they pay their utility bills. And so that sort of thing you can figure out and get assurance. Scope three gets really squishy just because people have so many uh, suppliers, you have distributors, transportation companies, you have multiple tiers in your supply chain. So the battery and, and car manufacturer well, so Elon wouldn't have this problem because he makes his own batteries. So, um, but this is going to have to be a partnership and there's going to be have to be transparency in the reporting because the battery manufacturers are going to have to say, well, I'm taking responsibility for this much and my customers are taking responsibility for the rest. I, I could give a better example for us, you know, because I understand our business a little better than the battery supply chain, but it, we were already talking to our suppliers and our customers and making it a partnership because somebody from, from the advocacy viewpoint, what Simon cares about is every ton of carbon that goes in the atmosphere. He would like somebody to take responsibility for it. Just one, one company is good enough. And if there's a say 10 of a certain category and a customer takes responsibility for five and the supplier takes responsibility for five, Simon would be happy but we have to have transparency in reporting and not this very fuzzy where nobody really knows what's going on. I mean, I we have say, a, good, sorry, go ahead, Simon. And I, I would just say one other thing that would make me happy that, that offsets get in the way of is business model transition, right? And so what we really need right now to cut emissions in half to get to zero by 2050 is for high carbon intensive industries to become lower carbon, to transition their business models, to move away from some of the more carbon intensive processes. And if those businesses are relying right now on offsets uh, to get to a, a lower sort of net zero future, um, that's not going to lead to the transition as an economic system we need. Simon, companies can play around with their expenses and net income in order to avoid taxes, all sorts of ways to do that. Money is tangible, trackable. Carbon dioxide is this odorless and invisible gas. So how much confidence should we have in companies tracking and eliminating this odorless, invisible gas? I think that's a, that's a great question, and it leads us to some of the problems, particularly on the scope three side of net zero, where it is difficult to actually calculate those emissions because much of that is coming outside of, of a company's boundaries. However, uh, when I think about my own organization and how we look at a company, you need to have at least 70% of your scope one and two, those direct operational emissions, externally verified to be on our A-list. Now, what that means is it's sort of like getting your audited financials, right? You're having a third party come in and check your work and identify that the emissions you're providing are actually accurate. And so I think that's a really important signal to the marketplace that you're providing accurate emissions to your stakeholders. When we get into scope three, I think that's a little bit more of the challenging area because you're relying on your supplier emissions or uh, estimations, perhaps, if you're thinking about an automobile manufacturer, they might be calculating emissions uh, based on the use of their cars uh, with people driving them. There's a lot of factors that come into getting that number exactly right. The issue right now, that number is so big, what we really need is to make it uh, go down significantly. So maybe not getting too wrapped up in the exact number at this point. As we, uh, we're at our time here, but as we wrap up, I'd like to get Christina's response to a recent tweet from Na NASA scientist Peter Kalmas, whose handle is at Climate Human. He wrote, quote, politicians consider banks too big to fail, but don't apply that same thinking to our earth, end quote. So what, do you, what does that say about how government and regulators are handling systemic risk? If banks are too big to fail, but the planetary system is not considered too big to fail. Well, because we, <laughs> we were in a situation not too long ago where banks came closer, certain ones, and did fail. Um, unfortunately, you can't have that situation with Earth. And so because it's something that we have never really seen, we've seen the damage to the Earth, it's hard to be uh, 
to to apply that exact same mentality we should but uh unfortunately uh, if earth were to fail then we wouldn't we wouldn't be here right now and so i think it's a matter of just becoming more and more proactive and with politicians um you know thinking more long term as opposed to just the the term of their uh you know how long they're going to be on capitol hill or wherever so um I, it's it's a great point from the nasa tweet guy that, that's yeah <laughs> climate human all right last word uh peter and and, and daryl as we wrap up you know you think this is going to can capitalism re reform itself and, and make these make these changes that are necessary daryl and then simon Oh, I don't think capitalism has to reform itself. I think we just, I, I think it's the answer. I'm, I'm a big fan of free markets and the price signal and, and you know, clear and concise regulation. Uh, but I think, uh, I think we have what it takes. Simon? Yeah, I, I think that uh, I'm also just a believer in, in humans. Uh, and I think that we have what it takes as a, as a species to, to, to protect our, ourselves, really, because uh, the planet will will figure itself out at a later date. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, uh, cautiously, and, and we have, I think, the tools in the toolbox. Uh, so it's it's more about activating them. Mm -hmm. And to Christina's point, maybe you know taking this a bit more seriously and acting like we've been through uh, a too big to fail moment and and, and mm -hmm. still still here. So uh, you know I'm I'm hopeful and optimistic, and, and it's been a great part uh, to hear to hear everyone's perspectives on this call. It makes me even more so. Podcasts of Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be hard and depressing. It also can be exciting and interesting, as we, as we saw today. So we believe that you know addressing climate begins with talking about it. So please subscribe to the pod, or even better yet, share it with a friend. It really does help open up the conversation. This program has been generously underwritten by our friends at the Errol Foundation. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody.